So let's talk about failure criteria right now. Uh, let's consider a uniaxial tensile specimen. And I know you already looked at that in developing a more circle when we looked at if I section it in different directions, we will get different stresses. But let's look at a uniaxial tensile specimen in terms of how it fails. Okay. So if we mount this uniaxial tensile specimen in a testing machine, so it's cylindrical specimen gripped at the two ends, and we load it under displacement control and plot force versus elongation. What we'll see is initially the force uh, displacement behavior will be linear. We expect that, a linear elastic material. However, at some point, it's going to plastically deform. And this isn't force versus strain, it's, uh, or stress versus strain, it's force versus elongation, so be aware of that. But in a lot of materials, we tend to see uh, a strain hardening effect. So once it starts to plastically deform, we can still increase in uh, the amount of force that that structure can carry. We call this strain hardening. At some point, you're going to reach a maximum. Necking will start to occur. So we will localize the deformation. The cross-section of that cylinder will reduce. And the force begins to drop off. And that will eventually lead to complete failure of the specimen. Now, if we take a close look at the actual failure mode there, and I have a few specimens zoomed up on that, we see that it's not failing uh, in that plane of maximum principal stress. Okay? We already showed that more circle for a uh, uniaxial tensile test means that the uniaxial applied stress is your maximum principal stress. We see that there is an angle, and you can actually measure it, and it is approximately plus or minus 45 degrees. So here's a nice cup, uh, that, uh, a shear cup that is formed that is uh, on the 45 degrees. Sometimes you get 45 through most of the specimen. Okay, so it's some uh, combination of uh, planes in the positive and negative 45 degree orientation. What is going on here is if we recall the Mohr circle for uniaxial loaded, so we already looked at this before, uh, your stress is P divided by A, so that's our maximum principal stress. Stress in the Y direction is zero, and so we get the following Mohr circle with a radius of P divided by 2A, which happens to also be our maximum shear stress. So it's just the uh, more circle for that stress element. If we look at what's happening on that 45 degree plane, this is the point, this is the surface corresponding to the, uh, the cross section uh, through the cylinder, because that's where our uniaxial tensile stress is. And if we rotate an angle of 45 in physical space, will give us uh, uh, 90 degrees, sorry, 2 theta on the Mohr circle. So this theta refers to the theta in physical space. Obviously, that's 90 degrees on the Mohr circle. We see that at negative 45 or positive 45, we're at the maximum shear stresses. So we get the maximum shear stress, which in a uniaxial test, this isn't a general formula, this is just the formula for the uniaxial test, is sigma 1 divided by 2. We know that in a uniaxial test, we derive a stress allowable called the yield stress. So we look at what stress does yielding occur? That is a normal stress. So that occurs when sigma 1, because that's our stress in the x direction, is equal to our yield stress. So if we combine these two, we can say, well, shear stress seems to be dominating that failure mode. Our failure is occurring on a plus minus 45 degree plane. So failure is likely a result of shear stress reaching a limit. So this is our engineering yield stress. We just do a test, calculate a stress, but it's not really related to the failure mode. The failure mode is related to shear, so we can combine these and come up. This is the classical Tresca yield criterion that says uh, a material will fail when the maximum shear stress in any orientation reaches the yield stress divided by two. 
This is um, a failure criteria for ductile materials. What we see in here is we were taking, you know, the yield stress is an engineering value. We do a test, we get that normal stress value. But then we look at how does the structure fail and try and better align those parameters. So in a ductile material, if you go back to your materials course, what is yielding? Yielding is dislocation movement. And dislocations move along consistent slip planes through shear. Okay, so that deformation and failure mechanism is dominated by shear stress. So it makes sense physically that shear is driving that failure. If you have a brittle material, however, if I take a composite, well, composites may be a bad example because it's got multiple components. Uh, take a ceramic. If I made a cylindrical specimen out of ceramic, pulled it in tension, it would break right in that perpendicular plane. There would be no plus minus 45 because shear has absolutely nothing to do with the failure mode. Brittle materials fail just due to exceeding the pulling force between atoms. So it's when the normal stress reaches a certain maximum value. So that suggests another failure criteria. It's in the book, but you don't have to memorize it or, or remember it. But you have a different failure criterion for that different class of material. Okay. Now, looking at this failure criterion, we can kind of come up with uh, an interesting confusion that uh, is often uh, come across by students. And that is what happens if you have a biaxial loaded specimen. Okay. So when we had a uniaxial loaded specimen, we saw our Mohr circle looks like this. Our maximum shear stress is just sigma x divided by 2. And so our yielding will occur when um, the shear stress reaches the yield stress divided by 2. But how is the Mohr circle going to look like in a biaxial loaded specimen? Well, if I look at this stress state, what can I say about it already? What property does it have? There's no shear. There's no shear. Okay? So it's still the principal stresses. So it will look similar to this, except sigma x still remains the same. I haven't put numbers, but let's assume it's the same value. Sigma y is half of sigma x over 2. So this principal stress is going to translate to the location of the center. Okay? So the Mohr circle is going to shrink. If you think about the Tresca yield criterion is saying, well, when the radius of that Mohr circle is half the yield stress divided by two, we have failure. So this seems to indicate that if you biaxial load a structure, it becomes stronger, which isn't very intuitive. This is where, although we do Mohr circles in, in two dimensions, this is where you have to sometimes consider um, three dimensions. Okay? So if I think about this as instead of as a square, but as a cube with the z direction coming in and out of the screen, what is my stress in that direction? It's zero. We have no stress acting in and out of the page. And there's also no shear stress acting there. So I actually have a third principal stress that is equal to zero. And in any plane stress problem, that will always occur. We're looking at rotation within the plane, find the, the orientation of the axes where I have no shear. Always in that third dimension, I will have a principal stress of zero um, because of that plane stress state. Now in fully 3D problems, it gets a little bit more complex. That might have a value. And again, I said the Mohr circle translates into a Mohr sphere and it's difficult to visualize. So we won't look at that. But that three-dimensional aspect comes into play. So if we consider that as a cube rather than um, as, a, as just a simple square, we know that sigma z is equal to zero. That's our plane stress assumption. And the shear stresses acting on this face are also zero. So that is the definition of a principal stress. And we will obtain our third principal stress 
is equal to zero in plain stress problems. So what happens then is if we're considering the problem as three dimensional, we have three different planes that you can create a more circle for. Okay? This sort of should be yellow, but the projector is not so good. This face here is the yx plane, which we've already um, calculated the more circle for. That was the sigma x and sigma y, which was happened to be sigma x over two. And that gave us this small more circle. Okay? So that we already did. But you could then change your perspective to a different plane. Okay? So if we consider the uh, zy plane, so now we're looking at this face, sigma y is there, but sigma z is equal to zero. Okay? So it's an element that looks like this. And it's also, because we have no shear stresses in this case, our principal stress plane. So we have a maximum principal stress at sigma y, uh, which is this point here, and in the other direction is zero. So we're going to get a second Mohr circle that represents the yz plane. Now the more interesting one in this case is if you look at the um, xz plane, now we have uh, our uniaxial load sigma x in the z direction, we have nothing. This is indeed that original, before we looked at the biaxial load, the original Mohr circle. So principal stress of sigma one, uh, principal stress of zero, and we get a third Mohr circle that has that maximum shear stress. Okay. But now our 45 degree rotation is not within the yx plane, it's within the xz plane. So it still fails at that 45 degree angle, it's just rotating in three dimensional space. So what we see from here, this is the exact, if we looked at just the uniaxial loaded case, this large Mohr circle is the same one. So biaxially loading it didn't change the point at which it fails. Our maximum shear stress will still be the same. But it changes the three dimensional orientation of that failure plane. So you have to be careful in looking at a uh, Mohr circle if you know, if you're looking at this plane, which is our original plane, we had this smaller Mohr circle, but there was this larger one hidden because of our principal stress of zero. Okay. So how you identify that will depend on how you can visualize it. Some people uh, like formulas as a crutch. So I always say effectively you have three possible maximum shear stress you have to check which one's largest, okay? It's always the difference of all the principal stresses and sigma three is always zero for a plain stress problem, which is what we'll limit ourselves to in this course. So if we go back to this, what if sigma y is equal to zero? As I said, this more circle that we produce is smaller, but we have these other two hidden Mohr circles that intersect with our principal stress of zero and the other two principal stresses. So when we look at that hidden principal, uh, that hidden Mohr circle, we still see that our maximum shear stress is sigma x divided by two. So we would get failure at the same applied stress. So in fact, the biaxial load doesn't change the stress in the x direction at which failure will occur, it just changes the orientation of the failure plane. This was the, the three uh, shear stresses. What we can actually do is plot how this would look in the principal stress uh, coordinate system. And what I mean by that is if I make a plot showing values of sigma one and sigma two. Sigma three is always equal to zero because we're, this is for plane stress. We can create what is known as a failure surface, okay? Failure surface is just a nice plot that you make. If you're inside the surface, then you're below your limit for failure. If you're outside of it, your structure has failed. So if we look at this 
criterion, uh, tau max is sigma yield over two. If I'm in the positive sigma one, sigma two quadrant, so both sigma one and sigma two are positive. If both of them are positive, I absolutely have this hidden Mohr circle. Okay? So if I have that hidden Mohr circle, it doesn't matter what the value of sigma one and sigma two are. I'm always going to have this maximum stress that is sigma one, uh, maximum shear stress that is sigma one divided by two. Therefore, I will have limits with either sigma one exceeding the yield or sigma two exceeding the yield. If either one of those exceeds yield, then I would fail. Similarly, if I look at the, uh, the negative quadrant, I get the mirror image of this. So both my principal stresses are negative. And if they're both negative, I will always have this hidden circle defined by the maximum principal stress divided by two. So my limits will be uh, when the maximum principal stress, whether it be sigma two or sigma one, reaches yield. The other two quadrants are a little bit different. If we look at when sigma one is positive and sigma two is negative, the more circle we plot is the one where we have the maximum shear stress. Okay? The other two more circles are smaller. They're contained within that original more circle. Therefore, my maximum shear stress will be sigma one minus sigma two divided by zero, or sorry, divided by two. Don't divide by zero, that breaks mathematics. Um, so when that is equal to uh, yield stress over two, so we basically get that the absolute value of sigma one minus sigma two is equal to the yield stress. So that will give us a straight line defining failure. Okay. And similarly, we get the mirror image of it. They're both one's positive, one's negative. So the absolute value um, of one minus the other, when that's equal to the yield stress, we have failure. So this produces this failure surface. And really what you need to do is just consider whatever your principal stress one and two is, three is always zero for plain stress problems. If I'm within the blue area of this, I'm fine. It's just a graphical representation of this formula. But I like to show it on because it shows um, the regions where these hidden Mohr circles occur. So the hidden Mohr circles will occur, or well, there's always hidden Mohr circles, but the hidden one is always maximum if your two calculated principal stresses are non-zero and have the same sign, okay? So in this quadrant and this quadrant. So that changes how you calculate the limit. So there is that von Mises yield criterion for ductile materials. It's in the textbook if you're interested to look at it. There are brittle failure criterion for brittle materials that relate more to the normal stress. There's, uh, for composites, one of the most common ones is a Sai Wu uh, or the Sai Wu Hill or the Sai Hill. There's many different variations on it. Uh, but there are many, many, many more, especially when you get into composite materials. There are hundreds of failure criteria trying to describe the complex failure in composites. So, as I said, in this course, we are gonna limit ourselves to the Tresca yield criterion. That's the only failure criteria I'll ask you uh, in the exam. Uh, uh, just a word of a warning, if you, when the old exams get posted up, in previous years, we did also cover von Mises stress. So you might see a question that references the von Mises stress criteria, and just ignore that, okay? <laughs>